All right, and welcome to another episode of Startup Success Students. In this episode, you're going to learn from a friend who's come all the way from Portugal to talk with us about how he's been able to navigate his personal life so that he has been able to get so much success in this outward journey that we call our business life or our career achievements. And this entrepreneurial journey you're going to learn from features a founder of multiple years from 2014 onwards and beforehand, Yao was a CIO and COO. So very, very, very impressive guy. Let's let him in and let's learn from him. All right, so thanks for joining us all the way from Portugal. So we're going to go for Diego because we spoke about this just a moment ago. We both got tongue twisters of names. We were going to go for wow, wow, but I'm not, <laughs> my, mouth, my mouth's not allowing me to do that. So we're going to go for Diego, if that's okay. Sounds good. Crack nice, it, mate. Nice How meeting you, Ryan. Yeah, you too, man. You too. Listen, I'm really excited about this one. You got some amazing experience. I love the preamble that you put in um, in the booking form when we were scheduling the call as well. So I'm really excited to get into this and learn a little bit more about your journey. So just kick us off. First of all, just tell us what are you doing now? What are you up to these days? Well, <laughs> I, I keep shifting context very, very quickly. Uh, but so, yeah, well, first things uh, first. So name is Diego or Diogo. I'm 43 years old. Uh, my background is in computer science. I grew up in a small village in the center of Portugal, Cantanhed, close to Coimbra, which is one of the biggest cities. I think this, this will become important to our conversation, the place where you grow up and your roots and all that. But so I grew up in a small village. Um, I studied in Coimbra, which has one of the oldest, second oldest university in Europe in computer science, like I said. Uh, and then I started my career doing uh, programming, uh, e-commerce in the beginning of the year 2000. So wow. people were, weren't still, the only thing that worked a little bit was Amazon. Apart from that, there, mm. there was nothing. I, I, don't, I don't even know if we already had Google or still out of Vista, <laughs> but we were in the, in the shift. Do you remember uh, in okay. England we had we had a we had Ask Jeeves in England and it was like oh. a little butler that would it was okay. the weirdest thing ever. Was, <laughs> I guess they were trying to differentiate, but yeah, instead of going on Google, you'd go and ask Jeeves, and okay. this little butler would come through with yeah. like a, a the, the plate concept, that had your the answer. Makes you know? sense, yeah, but I, I don't remember <laughs> that one to be to be honest. Uh, but so what I started... an awesome time to join the e-commerce industry, mate. Year two thousand, that's amazing. Sorry. Yeah, and and the funny thing is that people were already trying to do things like shopping malls, electronic shopping malls, with grocery stores and many, many, many interesting things. So I started my career there. Then I decided to. So that was in Porto, in the north of Portugal, second biggest city. But then I decided I was a little bit uh, fed up with the, the traffic jams and all of that. And so I decided to come back to, to Coimbra. And uh, I joined a, an important IT company we have in the country called Critical Software, which was born over here um, in 1998. Um, and, um, and so I joined and I started programming in many different languages, but always web related, more or less. Uh, then I moved to, um, to product and project management. Uh, I've always felt I wanted to go to management side. Mm -hmm. I always loved marketing. I, I don't have uh, training on it, but I, I love to explore it. So I have went exploring a little bit of marketing, then business, sales, tendering, uh, which is the creation of all the proposals the company did. And the funny thing is, so then we created, a, I, I'm summarizing it very quickly, but I think it's just to give an highlight. Then we created a startup within the company. We created a new company to focus on healthcare with the idea of bringing technology and knowledge to the area of healthcare. And so we started doing AI in the... 2005, it was when we started thinking of it. We formal, we incorporated wow. the company in 2008, end of the year. Wow. So I've been working in AI, um, more from a management perspective, but AI for healthcare since that time. So nowadays everyone accepts mm. AI um, because Google is doing it. Then you have self-driven cars and things like that. So everyone accepts it. But AI is a concept that comes from the 50s. So it's something that has different iterations and then the technology evolves and then you can do more things with it. For so sure, it even, even comes from earlier than that, doesn't it? Because I know there's yeah. books like 1984, Brave New World, like they were written in the 40s even. And the people yes, are yes, already yes, thinking yes, about the yes. future of flying things that were automated and all that sort of good stuff that comes with it. Yeah. Mate, so you, you, you learn a lot of your business acumen and your capability now as, as a founder is 
kind of created off the back of working with this big company that you ended up getting some ties with and the experience that you had with them to a certain extent that's what allowed yeah. you to get your first foundational kind of knowledge Look, in I, business is that is that fair to yeah say? i think uh so from a training perspective uh at the university the the, the degree i took uh, the classes i took were it's what we call a large spectrum um, engineering training so which means you don't specialize in a specific thing you have a broad spectrum of knowledge that you can apply so that's why you can be a technical guy or a manager uh, within I, the it area of course so my career is basically a kind of a on-the-job mba so i yeah. in the beginning i thought about doing an mba and then I, I i stopped thinking about it and i said everyone is doing mbas I'm having the opportunity of doing of doing it and learning from for, for myself. Sometimes I make mistakes, of course, like anyone else. Um, but the fact is that I had many, many opportunities to grow up by learning how to do it, with obviously yeah. some mentoring from uh, other other guys at the company with more experience than myself, and always very inspiring uh, leaders. Uh, so people that are able to put you in a room, give you a, one of those speeches that afterwards you, you can conquer the world. Mm. And so I've, I've learned, I'm, I'm, I'm very much driven by that. I'm someone that believes a lot on myself. If I don't believe on myself, no one will. So I, I need to be very confident. Obviously, I need to understand my limitations and those kind of things. But I need to believe that I can change the world. And so yeah. looking at the examples of many of the IT entrepreneurs, uh, Steve Jobs, Richard Brands, and all those names that we, we hear, heard about, we hear about, um, it has been always an inspiration uh, in terms of pursuing what you, you're trying to do. In this company, which is just one of the examples of my life, because I'm involved in many other things, but in this company, I think the motivation, the reason for being there is to try to contribute a little bit to make the world a better place by reducing blindness uh, from some of the, of, of, because we, we focus in ophthalmology, in retinal mm. diseases. So mm. mainly I work with diabetes, with the consequence of diabetes in terms of eye care, uh, which is diabetic retinopathy. So what we do is to provide AI technology that can, in a more affordable way, uh, detect people that are suspicious of having problems of diabetic retinopathy. In this wow. way, avoid blindness because you need to be treated very wow. very um uh quick quickly wow uh, so how long how long has that that product been going for now well this product which is the most relevant one has been going for 2000 since 2012 wow and how many people have been able to benefit for example from in portugal which is where we have our biggest customer base we have half a million of diabetics <laughs> the technology. Wow. so every day people are screened with this technology. So people are photographed using a certain equipment or so some fundus cameras, so those are the names. So they and have to go even, somewhere to do that. Where do they go yeah, to they, get So that? people, diabetics are invited by their family doctor uh, to go to a certain uh, place and um, um, take the photographs. And then those photographs are need to be analyzed. In the, in the early days, those photographs would be analyzed just by an ophthalmologist, which would tell you, okay, go to, the, go to an appointment to check if everything is okay, because there's something suspicious there. Nowadays, they first go to the AI system, which is able to automatically analyze a significant percentage of them. And this way it reduces costs of doing this. Yeah, okay. And what, what gave you the idea that that was somewhere that you guys could target as you know, bringing an AI to the market to solve that specific problem? What, what set you guys off in that direction? Is there, was there like a personal connection to that problem or? What, no. What, how uh, did, what led you there? How did you yeah, get there? It was a personal connection, but not a personal connection because one of us uh, was <laughs> a diabetic or anything like that. So the thing is, I, I didn't explain, but so behind this company called Critical Software, uh, which is a company that became famous because the first customer was NASA, the US space agency. One of the last customers was BMW from Germany. We chose one company in the world to create a joint venture to develop all the software for the cars. That company is called Critical TechWorks. It's a joint venture, venture between BMW and this critical software group. It's based in Portugal. So many wow. of my colleagues are working there. So this gives you an idea that we are talking about a company that works for the most demanding markets. Another example, mm -hmm. many years ago, when the, everyone joined the European Union and there was the, the, there was, uh, the enlargement to 25 countries, 
um, there was this thing about the Schengen space to be able to go across borders. And there was a problem that the, the U European Union wasn't being able to solve. The company that corrected the IT system to do that was, was us because it was during the Portuguese presidency of the, wow. of the union. And so I wasn't involved, but many of my colleagues were. Um, so, um, um, so the company is used to work in the most demanding markets. And because of that, it's used to also try to bring technology from some of these more rich markets like aerospace, aeronautic, and things like that, where you have a lot of money for research and try to bring that knowledge, try to bring it to other areas, more civilian markets. So it was part of our culture to try to uh, uh, bet to invest in other areas. Now, why healthcare? Well, I think everyone understands the impact we can have on our lives if we do something in healthcare. But the reason why we got into it and into ophthalmology and into all of that was because there was a, uh, a meeting uh, between one of the founders of the company and mm -hmm. one of the founders of a research institute that exists here in Portugal, also called okay. IBL, which is a very important research institute in ophthalmology created by this professor called Kunyavaj, which is one okay. of the top diabetic retinopathy guys in the world and by coincidence they met in the in a meeting of the Coimbra University and they said okay why don't we put our engineering competences with your clinical knowledge working together and try to do something to come up with new products and that, that was the the reason I guess when you've got those credentials when you work for a company that's got that reputation that's like got those kind of highlights to shout about you know it's a no-brainer right if you need someone to try and help you solve a problem uh, you want someone who's got those kind of credentials behind them, isn't it? So very yeah, good but, experience. But some, sometimes it can also be a, a problem. And I think what you what we want to, to discuss here, it's also about the lessons we, we, we get during the, the process. And for example, we made mistakes. We, we, for example, in the beginning, when we designed our first product, we didn't realize the product that we were designing was pretty much focused in doctors doing research. So we thought we were going to sell it to everyone in the world. And then we realized that the only doctors that were paying attention to it, because it was so innovative, but so innovative, it's like, okay, we have this, uh, let's imagine we have a certain new analysis that allows you to detect COVID in a more easy way, but no one knows that you have it. So, uh, so it will take years until, until someone starts asking for it. It's the adoption so, curve, isn't it? You know? Yeah. And so we faced that problem. And then we had to pivot the company and come up with different products. And that's when we started realizing that the market was ready to what is called screening, which is the process of inviting people to be photographed because they are already doing that. And then use the AI to reduce the cost of doing it. And that's powerful because then you guys know that strategically you've got a business for a good few years as well because your original idea the world isn't quite ready for yet you've made that concept fit the current context haven't you so you've yeah. proven that you've got agility even in the fundamental design of it so that's you can proper get behind that you can tell good stories to potential investors and stakeholders and yep. people you want to partner with as well so it's a fantastic context to set a business up in isn't it but listen like you rightly said there we do also want to talk about problem not just problems but personal trials and tribulations, lessons that you've learned across your time. And so what I'm interested in is this notion of resiliency. Normally we talk about success, right? And you start up success students, but I like this topic of resiliency also. And I, I can tell if you've gone through this fast, because you look still like quite a young man. I don't know, maybe you're just, uh, maybe maybe it's just living in Portugal, eating the natural the produce sunshine, of all the yeah. sunshine, yeah? You're probably <laughs> 60 years old, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you got a walking years. stick next to you, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what, when you have gone through quite a fast rise to get to where you are, right? It does, it seems that way because you look quite young and you're in quite a good position there. And as a, uh, they're incredible numbers for your business in terms of half a million people they've been able to support. That's, that's astounding. So, along the way, though, it's not all, not all the, it's not all the cool summer breeze that we, we might hope it to be. And there's also, there's trials and tribulations, as we say, as we go. So, can you like when you reflect back and you look back on the journey that you've shared with us, what do you see to be as like the key moments where you've had to dig deeper or stretch yourself to think differently? And uh, just can you tell us about any of those particular moments? Yeah, there were there were many. Um, in I haven't explained you uh, yet, uh, and I think it's important to try to understand who I am in terms of okay, I have certain characteristics like anyone else. Uh, but so 
when I mentioned in the beginning that I grew up in a small village, I think mm. that is important because I always had the, the, I always knew that whenever you want something, you need to do whatever you, you need to get it. Uh, and I, I always remember a couple of examples from my youth. I wanted to practice karate. I set up a dojo. I found a teacher. We set it up. It ran for two years, something like that. I wanted to play table tennis. I set up a team. We we played for two years also. So I was used to, you want something, you go after it. Okay. So the excuse, oh, it's not available. That the in AI is because I'm very resilient or you can say I'm very stubborn uh, or I don't I don't give up uh, which is something uh, you know the um, um, I think one of the best ways to motivate any guy from IT and me specifically it's like uh, in the back to the future movie so whenever someone tells you that you can't do it that's the best way to make me do uh, anything so because sometimes you 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 go so you 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 do even better than what you thought you could do and i have a yeah. couple of examples of that in this specific process it has been it is a, a pleasure to be here still today but the, there are a lot of details about this so i uh, things like in the in the meantime i bought the company in the meantime i found an investor and sold parts of the company in the in the meantime i lost most of the team because they moved to another bigger startup with deep pockets that could pay a lot of money. So, wow. I, you know, being related, being working in a startup, like we all know, it's like um, during the day, it's like having all the types of weather. So you, you can conquer the world or, or you're going bankrupt. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and either you love it or, or you hate it. Uh, the fact is, I like it. But during this process, which, you, which has been going for many years, of course, already uh, more than 10 years um, obviously there were moments where I thought about giving up like anyone else and I think in those moments what made me what gave me joy in life to overcome the challenges and, and all those things was that I've never I, I was never only focus in one single thing, which may be a good thing or a very bad thing, okay? Mm. You will find people telling you, you need to focus, get out of your job, focus on your startup, all those, all that crap that we, we know and we read about. And sometimes it makes sense. But at the same time, you read guys saying, oh, you shouldn't leave your job because if you can't pay the bill at the end of the month, then you can sleep. And if you can't sleep, you don't perform. So I'm, I try to be very neutral uh, and try to think on both sides of the of the story now personally there were moments where i had to look at other things around me like playing table tennis or like coming up with this other project of a museum of computing uh, and mm. those things gave me joy in life in a way that allowed me to okay let things settle down let things because we need the time i've always realized we need time for this to succeed and the fact is that we are now in a very good context with a new investor and all of that. And that comes specifically because I was able to tolerate it for so many years. I had many, many friends and mentors telling me I wouldn't have, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't have taken this until today. I would give up sooner than you did. Mm. I never did. And I think that's pretty much because to me, it's very hard to say, okay, I'm giving up because when you give up, it means, okay, you may say, okay, uh, um, uh, failing is part of the, of the path. We all know about that, but come on, no one likes to fail, of course. So if you <laughs> believe there is this, this tiny chance of succeeding, uh, well, normally I try to, to, to get it. And the fact is that that's what's been happening. So I'm very happy with how things are today. It has been a very complicated process with a lot of learning moments. Um, uh, guys that I work with that I didn't like that much. But then I, I look back and I say, come on, I learned so much with them. So mm -hmm. there was all these egos, all these things that are normal in any team. But resilience, it's pretty much about being very stubborn in the sense that you know where you want to go. Not that, for example, I'm not one of those guys that, okay, I have this vision, I'm going to land, uh, I'm going to start visiting Mars or anything like that. No, that's not an objective to me. And I, normally, 
I don't plan an objective like that. I prefer to let it go and see where I can take it. Always thinking in a very ambitious way. Always. Yeah, you're more thinking, yeah, it goes back to learning, doesn't it? It's like I always say, and I think this is another kind of key thing that is known in, in the business world as well. There's no such thing as failure. There's only learning. And I think that's a great perspective to take. And in that way, you always see yourself growing. You always see your ideas growing too, don't you? Yeah, but at the same time, you, all, you also say that many times when you are accepting, okay, I failed and I need to get out in a, in a good way from this. So, okay, I've learned. Of course, we learn from the failure. I'm not saying, and it's normal. Come on, I've failed in many things in my life also. It's not like, oh, everything is success. No, it's not. Mm. But for example, many you will find many, I, I like to read about many other guys that somehow uh, I admire. Uh, yeah. And I, I normally like the guys that are hardworking more mm. than guys that were born with a certain talent, guys that train more than anyone else. There's this saying, I don't remember who it is from, like, if the other guys are better than you, are more skilled than you, then you have to overtrain them. Uh, so guys like, for example, when you think about Bruce Lee in martial arts, which was also a philosophical, uh, philosophical guy. Yeah, yeah. When you think about Cristiano Ronaldo in terms of not, not, I'm not about the discussion if he's better than Messi or not, but the fact that everyone says that the guy keeps training after the training is ended, has ended. So all those details about being an art worker is something that mm. I pay a lot of attention. And for example, guys like Bruce Lee, you, you read a lot about saying um, defeat is, it only happens when you accept it. So until the, you can read guys saying, if you have one euro or one pound in the, in the bank, keep going, <laughs> keep going until you, while you can. So I think if you believe, even if you have doubts, but if you believe you need to keep going. I think what drives me is thinking like this. What if it was possible and I gave up sooner than I should? Mm. How, how am I going to live with that? I prefer to face the defeat when I see, okay, I don't have any other option. Okay, I'm done. But yeah, and you can, can always trust in yourself as well. This is the thing that I've realized as well. It's like, like you're saying, right? It's good to have a big vision and an idea and something that you want, but don't break it down into incremental little parts and give your life away to follow this plan dogmatically. You're going to lose life yeah. and you're going to miss out on losing the emergence like when you bring an idea into the world, it lives, it breathes, it has its own. It's like a living organism, isn't it? You know, it's amazing. I, it's, I like, love... it's like it's like building a Frankenstein in a way. And then you're like, yeah. OK, how does it behave? What's the how are customers using it? What's the behavior of this thing? I, I and how are we saying, shaping that behavior? It's amazing. It's, it's very, very important because sometimes a twist in these Latin countries like Portugal, probably Spain also. People are many times they they grow up they grow up and they hear things like oh don't share your idea the idea is everything you need to protect it come on that's bullshit you need to share it and whenever you share it you will realize that people will make you questions will give you ideas yeah. and you start looking at it and you realize this can be much bigger than I thought and that's mm. something that I think the the guys in US are much more let's say uh, used to it than we are in Europe. But um, I think that's, that's pretty right. So you need to share it. Obviously, if you want to patent something, you need to be careful. But don't, don't lose life thinking about it and uh, do it. It's better to do it than just think, dream about what you could do. Yeah, and, and to a certain extent, it's almost easy to have the ideas. At least it kind of seems to be for most people coming up with an idea. Anyone can come up with a good idea. It's the yeah. execution. That's the tough bit, you know, pulling off what's in your head. Um, you know, I've had a few a few examples of taking marketing funnels to market, trying to start up a startup accelerator program. And like my background's working with tech companies with transformation programs. I'm an agile transformation coach by trade, yeah. And I had a very quick rise to like leading teams of people. And I've done a few bits, startup stuff, and I've worked with different companies, different sizes, and well-rounded experience. And I took something to market that I thought was going to get me tech startups that had funding that was scaling faster than they could cope and I could help them get more capacity with what they've already got without changing a thing other than how they organize internally, you know? And that in, in itself would become a growth plan. So I took this thing to market and I ended up getting just a completely different caliber of person. I got people, but not the caliber of person I was hoping for. And that comes without a paycheck and more risk. And I went through the process, took a, took a couple of clients on board just for the sake of, going through of it because there was interest so I could learn from the whole end-to-end -end experience, you know? But ultimately, like, the, the, the difficulty of pulling off what's in your head, I think, is 
is uh, is one of the biggest challenges when you've got this very artistic kind of mind. Yeah. And I think for people like you and I, we're also driven by our ambitions. And I, I'll, I'll talk for myself here, but sometimes I don't even know where it comes from. Like I, I can think back and I can summarize and I can say it might be because of my, this, that or the other. But the truth is, like, it just seems to, it's just, it's relentless for me. It just keeps coming. I say it, it's almost like there's someone in the back of my head that runs to the front inside of my forehead here with a sticky note and just slaps an idea in, it, in the inside of my, and I've got to go and do that idea now. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. That's the way it works for me. But I've learned to put some ideas in the drawer and don't act on all of the ideas. I've learned that. I've learned not about easy. working. <laughs> not easy. Yeah. Not easy. It's also not easy to kill the ideas once you've got moving with them because you know they're bad ideas, you know. Yeah. But I just wondered from your perspective then, this notion of ambition, right, is, is obviously something that drives you too. So talk to us a little bit about this. Did it start in the village from the, from the need of like needing to create everything that you wanted or where did this come from? Do you think? No, I think, and it's funny because I addressed that in a, in a talk I gave not so long ago. Um, and I think... Obviously, there are things that you, you learn from your family. I, from my mother, I always give the example that we need to uh, keep our promises. That's something I respect a lot. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Um, uh, my father gave me a lot of examples of doing entrepreneurial things. Uh, and so uh, I, I had all those examples. Then, uh, then I had my internal characteristics. Then I'm very creative. I, 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 I've always loved to learn what a guy working with metal, with wood, with those kind of things. I, I've learned, I've always wanted to learn more. Uh, but independently of all of that, I think the main aspect that drives me in terms of ambition was the culture from this critical software company. And I told mm. the guys about this because we're talking about one of those companies that I joined. And when I look at my career, I've was always involved in startups because even this big corporation now with two or three thousand um, individuals uh, and several companies and things like that when i joined was 50 guys and it was 50 guys with 23 24 years old so when we were capable of conquering the world so when you look at and I've, I've studied this also because of the the museum that I'm related to, and uh, there was a company in Portugal called Timex, the guys that do the the watches, and they were in Portugal and they did a lot of things for computing, um, and so it was the same thing. So a bunch of people in the beginning of their careers when they don't have the kids and all those things, so they they could focus on it and they were very happy to work together. And, the fa and for example, in my personal experience from this critical software group, I remember having colleagues saying things like, man, I would pay to work with these guys around me because they are all so much cleverer than I am that if I don't push very strong, I'm going to lose the, the, the journey. They, they're going to move much, much faster than I am. So I need to give all that I have. And even if I'm not the best technical guy, then I need to overcome that with other things that I have that probably others don't have. I don't know many people that are more determined than I am, but I'm not the best technical guy for sure. There are many others that are better. I normally say I, I don't specialize in anything, but I always know who to call. So I know who are the guys that I have in my network that can help me with a certain matter. Uh, and I try to use that to my advantage, of course. Yeah. So having ambitious people more skilled more experienced than yourself around you and around you doesn't mean you oh i need to set up an advisory board yeah that can help but it doesn't mean that imagine you have a bunch of friends that are also ceos of, of startups go and have lunch with them every two or three days find a different friend go and talk with them see how things are going because then you start seeing, for example, the difficulties that they are facing and you and you think, oh, I thought my life was bad. Come on, he's in a, a worse <laughs> position than I am. Or, uh, or no, oh, this guy is very exciting what he's doing and probably is doing something that I can also do in, internally. So mm. come on, don't stay in, in your house or in your office. Go to the street, talk to your friends, try to find people that have more experience and try to learn from them. That would be my suggestion. I think the ambition comes from that thing, from those people around you, in my opinion. Wow. So it's less about your conditioning and more about how you almost deliberately consciously structure the life that you live to make sure that you've got the right kind of influences in your mind so that you can have the ambition 
Would you yeah, say I that's think, fair? Yeah, I think it's it's tricky because we can make the parallel with the like the thing about can we teach entrepreneurship or not? And I mm. have many doubts about it. You can you should teach the basis of it. And obviously, there are things that some people are more, it's more easy to do than to others. And that affects, of course, but there are uh, also many things that you can train if you really understand that, okay, this is in my uh, critical path. I need to overcome this. For example, one of the guys that I admire most uh, from, from this company, and I'm a good friend of him, in the beginning, and he knew this, he was not a good communicator. And he was a, a kind of a scary guy. When you have the first contact, it was not one of those friendly individuals that immediately there's empathy and you start, it's like you, we know each other for many years. No, it's one of those guys that it seems like there's a distance, but it's not, it's not a real thing. It's really a matter of um, how you smile and how you behave, yeah. all those, uh, those um, um, emotional, I'm missing the word, but um, the concept. Emotional of, intelligence, isn't it? Yeah, from Goldman, yes. Uh, yeah. Precisely. EQ. Yeah, precisely. And so the fact is he realized that and he trained that, of course. And for example, this, he, he's not a manager. He's a leader. He's one of, of these guys that he goes into a, a, a room with 500 people and he gives you a speech and in the end everyone is motivated to do the extra mile and to accomplish a certain objective so and i find that i think that's what i look that's what i keep looking for in my life i want to have a purpose i don't i want to obviously i need to have a salary i need to pay the the the, the bills at the end of the month like anyone else but i want to do something that i feel happy and that i have doubts if i can do it and Man, I, I mean, want... the company that you've got going already, the half a million people, well, that's a huge purpose, isn't it? You know, like, and to see the results and to see ways in which you can try and drive those numbers even more. And then you get the feedback from the efforts. You can bring a whole team of people on that journey with you. And also, don't forget the end users that are benefiting from the service. They go along the journey with you, too, if you can communicate it with them. It's, it's a very powerful thing to wake up every morning and hang your hat on, you know, and get yourself energized for. So. But I also know you're into a few things. You mentioned a few times your museum. I checked out the website. I've had a look at that too. Um, we, but tell us a little bit about it. It's like a collection of all of the first kind of computers, is it? Is it like from, how software is developed over time? It's like, it's like from, the, uh, the evolution of software almost, isn't it? From no, like it's, um, into... it's a very niche thing. But from okay. an entrepreneurial point of view, it's probably the most amazing project I was ever involved and I will ever be involved. Why? Because no one was expecting this, not, not even myself. So, uh, and this connects a lot to the UK. So 10, 10 years ago, not even that, uh, eight years ago, I decided to start collecting a certain brand of computers, British, uh, made by Sir Clive Sinclair. We just uh, died in September this year. So Clive Sinclair was the guy that was the leader of uh, the pocket calculators in the UK in the 70s that developed many other things in terms of Wi-Fi, many other things. And then in the 80s, he came up with these computers called the ZX Spectrum, ZX81, and many other computers like that. And that's, that was, a let's say, the beginning of the revolution that gave us the home computer. There was other brands like Commodore, Atari in US, Apple, many others. But, um, but in Europe and specifically in Portugal and in UK, it was at the end of the day, Sinclair. And in UK, it was also Acorn because Acorn developed a computer called the BBC Micro because BBC, the, the news channel sponsored it. And so there was an adoption in schools for young kids to, to, do, to, do, to start learning programming and maths and things like that. Now, this change completely a generation because you start you had a phenomenon in the uk called the bedroom programmer so you had people making making thousands of pounds developing teenagers teenagers yeah, yeah like mm. uh, matthew smith is an example he created many a lot designers. of them got raided by the fbi as well i mean in my hometown when i was about 17 there was a, a raid like by like proper like a mate like ridiculous like helicopters everything there's a kid in essex he'd hacked into the <laughs> from Essex in England, he'd hacked into, I think it was the FBI system. Okay. Just online, messing around with, with his friends in whatever community yeah. he's in. He's obviously awesome at what he's doing. Yeah. And he's got so himself into some trouble there. Precisely... They, they, they probably took him away. I don't... Yeah, 
it's precisely it's even probably before that because we're talking when we were not even connecting to bbs or to other systems using modems and things like that so it's here in in the beginning of the 80s now why a museum about this and why a portuguese guy concerned with this now mm. i normally say that i i'm a i'm i went to computer science and i started programming by learning by myself when i was very young because of this computer i've started learning my first words in english because of this computer wow and i i love entrepreneurship as i told you before and i i, I needed to find a way to say thank you bottom line say thank you on behalf of an entire generation about these things that change our life now in Portugal, these Sinclair computers were very, very, very relevant. Why? Because without going into too much details, but Sinclair made a partnership with a US company called Timex, which had a factory in Dundee in Scotland and another one among many others, but another one in Portugal. And in Portugal, they started assembling some of the computers uh, to sell in US, in Poland, in Argentina, in Portugal, in many other places. And in Dundee, they would assemble the computers for the UK. Now, so there was a lot of pioneers of Portuguese guys involved in this process, mm. which was more than just assembling, also developing some of the models. So when you start looking back a few years ago, you had something like, you thought that there were something like 30 programs and games developed in Portugal. And now, because of the work, not of myself, but many friends of mine that collaborate with the museum and other blogs and things like that, you have more than 1,000 softwares that were recovered and preserved uh, from old tapes, from old disks, from micro, micro drives, which are these tiny tapes that Clive Sinclair invented. And we've been doing all of that. Now, this gives me an extra, an extra let's say, pleasure uh, or satisfaction because not even in the UK no one thought about doing such a, a, a nomad mm. to Sir Clive Sinclair and I understand why because there are there were many others and because there were many others when you go to a certain technological museum in UK you will find a little bit of everyone what we're doing here is a niche thing but the problem or the opportunity is that the the Sinclair or ZX Spectrum is a niche that is so representative that every guy from 30 years old above knows about it. And so everyone remembers it and everyone played with one in a friend's house or anything like that. And so we, we are capitalizing this, uh, this opportunity. And the fact is, I started this because I started a personal collection. I made it progress into a museum because bottom line, I needed more space and I didn't have any more space at home. My <laughs> wife was complaining. I needed to find a way and I started thinking, okay, I need to convince the city hall to do a museum. And I think there's a potential here. And the fact is I was able to convince them. And then whenever you, you aim at something, it starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger and we're doing more. And yesterday we celebrated our first anniversary um, with a huge live event and so, Things are getting out of control. That's the, the thing I love about this project, which is I can't plan it. It keeps pushing me to go forward. And so it surpassed it surpass my best expectations. So that's why it's one of the best examples of, um, of resilience of all that. Why resilience? Because this is very nice to say and share. But at the end of the day, we're talking about a project made by this guy with a lot of friends that I involved, of course, I created an association to do it, a partnership with the city hall and all that. But this is not like a private company where you pay the bill and you, and you give the orders. No, this is volunteers work and things like that, which is very, very tricky to get people available to do it. Mm -hmm. So when I say resilience, what I mean is you can't imagine the amount of work this this and the amount of time this takes for me because at the end of the day if no one does it i need to do it if i want it to keep growing i need to do it but this it's funny because when i for example in the company where i'm the, the ceo and one of the founders if anyone asks me what do you do as a ceo my answer normally is this i do whatever the others don't do and the company needs to 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 survive to to grow up and in the museum is the same. Whatever I can find anyone to do, I need to do it. So that's how I look at it. And I think that's very important. So resilience, because, okay, you understand what you need to do and you, 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 you do it. 
independently yeah. of how much it costs. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess the beauty with a museum and it's something that's run by volunteers. I mean, I've also run a few events with with volunteers alone. I've come up with the idea, I've pitched the concept into big companies. Then we managed to get ten different tech partners on board, and it was a it's actually a, an event it's to help young people, event to help young exciting. people get their hands around uh, digital technology. So it's not the same. It's not a museum. It's a one off. They knew it was only going to be like a, a hard time for like maybe six months, extra work, and then it was going to be over. I, I did guess it for yours. Also. Biggest conference in Java language, programming language year. I was part of it also. So I have the experience of the events and I love the adrenaline. The only mm. difference is the museum, it's more long term. And, and then you it's start. It's more long term. Yeah. And you need to start thinking about other things, like, for example, so we are getting testimonies and testimonies, hours and hours in, of interviews. So now I have the responsibility of uh, somehow putting it in a book or in a documentary or something that basically make sure that the information that I got is not lost anymore because that's the purpose of the museum, of course. Yeah, exactly. I mean, with something like that, that's so long standing, it's going to be part of the community. My thought there was like, how can you make it like a community uh, place to be? Because if you make it part of the community and it's by people that are looking for a, an aspect of community in their lives because they've got some free time and they're looking for something to be, to be involved in, if you can paint the idea of this place as something that will benefit to the community, as well as for the idea and this guy, but if you focus it more on the community and less yeah. so, although it is obviously about this guy, obviously that's what the whole thing's about. And it's about the technology. You can't get away from that, of course not. But you can get a bunch of people that are there for that, for that reason, but also more than that, you know? And then maybe you find some the, sustainability the, there. The, the most relevant thing, and I normally try to do that. I think it's, it's something that I, um, I've uh, been doing over the years, which is you need to realize that you have friends, colleagues, whatever. You need to understand what is the motivation and the availability yeah. and the skills of everyone that you are working with. And you shouldn't have a problem if, uh, for example, I, there are things that one of my best friends, I know that I can count on him or I can't. And that's not a problem as long as I understand it. As long as so exactly, yeah. If you understand what everyone wants to give and what drives everyone, and I'm not saying, okay, I keep a pa some paper notes saying, okay, this guy <laughs> I'm going to, nah, come on, I don't do it. it. It has to be very natural. But if you understand it, and if you understand sometimes you need help, but you don't get it, but uh, it doesn't mean that in a couple of months you don't, you, you may get it. So you need to work around it and try to find creative ways to overcome those challenges and keep things moving. Absolutely. Find creative ways and keep things moving. I like that bit, definitely. Listen, we're coming nearly to time there. I love your story. I love the resilience aspects and the ambition side of it. You definitely are like a born, you're a born entrepreneur, aren't you? You were just like made for this. I think man. So, yeah. so yeah, I love it. one lesson to share then, your top lesson throughout the years, what would be your top tip, your one takeaway for someone who is a budding entrepreneur or maybe a young person who's yet to even start this, come, come along this video. Essentially, it's an entrepreneur that is a few years in their business. Maybe they're persevering right now and they're, they may be given up, but maybe they're also seeing that it could come good very soon. And so they don't want to give up just yet. What would be your one top tip to this kind of big group of people that are potentially listening? Look, it's <laughs> every case is a case. It's so hard. I think you need to trust your, your, your gut feeling and uh, you need to be very honest with yourself and do that analysis. I don't think I'm a good example on that. Uh, most people in my situation would have give, given up where I decided to continue just because I thought, okay, let's see where it, where it ends. I need to understand where it ends. Uh, but so you need to be very honest. And if you believe on it, uh, or if you can find ways to at least keep going and see, um, as long as you are comfortable with it, keep going. I think what happened to me in terms of what I've been able to do with the company, uh, it's... Uh, and, me with the guys working with me yeah. of course but i think it's it's an example of even when most people don't believe that you can still keep going the fact is we we did and when things were in the worst possible situation everything turned out fine it doesn't mean it will always going to be like that but uh, i think that's very important so believe on yourself uh, come on don't expect others it's very hard to find out sometimes you don't have anyone believing in yourself and if you mm. lose that faith, 
that that's that becomes a problem. I think there was a moment, if I may share, uh, and I and then I just wanted to give another tip of advice uh, sure. for younger people. But there was a moment in my life that I believe was very important, and I, I I can't explain how important it was, but I think it it changed me very in a way very strong. Which was when I was very young, my father took me to some athletics uh, classes or something like that, and I stayed there for a couple of years. And in the first training. I remember hearing my father saying to his friend, which was the coach, something like this. Oh, he's very thin. He's not going to be very good in this. And I, I, I don't know what age I was, but I, come on, my father likes me. That's not the, the, <laughs> the, the matter here. But the fact is, the fact that I heard my father saying that he didn't believe I was going to be able to do it gave me a strength that sometimes probably it's where I go, not thinking, oh, he doesn't believe on me. Not, not that. I have a, a, an amazing relationship with my father. But what I mean is, when you, when you see that even the person that should believe on you most doesn't believe on you, either that uh, puts you uh, going away or it gives you a lot of strength. In my case, it gave me a lot of strength and it gave me strength to believe in me whenever no one else does. Mm. Come on, I, I grew up with movies like uh, Karate Kid, the original, like Rocky, yeah, yeah. so you know how it is. Yeah. You, you keep all your strengths <laughs> to the end, and in the end, you're going to, to, to win it. So I believe, on, uh, I believe on that in a romantic way, of course. Yeah. The other tip, the other advice, if I may, I would like to give, and because sometimes I see so many mistakes, so many mistakes of people approaching, people that are looking for a job or things like that. There are so tiny things that can make the difference. For example, whenever mm. I have someone calling me saying, oh, uh, this uh, friend of mine is looking for a job, something like that, it's not a problem. It's good to ask your friends for help, of course. Uh, and in Portugal, it's, it's very cultural that you try to get this kind of friendship to, to do that. But the thing is, when you're trying to pursue your career, your life, and you are not the one controlling it, you are having others doing the work to you, that's strange. That always, I, I look at it in a very suspicious way. One thing is, I'm uh, presenting you Ryan. Ryan is a very nice guy, and I think you guys should talk because yeah, he wants to challenge you for something. That's one thing. The other thing is, oh, I, trying someone else trying to convince me of something. So what I'm trying to say is this, guys, I had huge examples, uh, uh, many examples of trying to approach someone that I thought it was unapproachable to me. I couldn't reach him. And I've, most of the times I was able to do it. You, got, you have LinkedIn, invest in LinkedIn, in having your profile there in a proper way. I have it not for, I have it like, like what it is and growing up for, I don't know, from the very beginning of my career, anyone, everyone in IT uses it. But so, make yourself presentable in the best possible way. Uh, whenever you want to address someone, try to find the right angle to do it. Try to, uh, so try to be extrovert, don't be shy, try to talk, but at the same time, be respectful of the time. Don't, uh, I talk a lot, but whenever I'm approaching someone that I know, okay, the guy is going to give me 10 seconds, I need to think, okay, what's my punchline? What am I going mm. to, my, my boss told me once, there is only one, one option, one possibility to make a first good impression. So you need, to, you need to invest everything on that, but you can do it. So plan it. Sometimes changing a project, finding an investor, it's all about making a certain connection. So look at it, not like, oh, if he answers, he answers. Come on, no, invest on it, but be professional on that part because sometimes that's the difference. Uh, and I've used that for the museum. I've used that for the company, Red Marker. I've used it for everything in my life. And normally I can reach whoever is needed. 100%. What a tip. I love that. Yeah. No one is unreachable, are they really? And that, nor should they be. Some people are difficult to contact, but you're right. If you can find the right way of presenting yourself and you can get yourself into the right space and you can use the right messaging, a whole new world does open up to you. It and takes a bit of trial and error. It does take a bit time, of trial and error to learn that. Timing also is relevant and it doesn't mean yeah. I have a lot of examples of people I tried to approach for the museum. They didn't answer. I was obviously unhappy. I was upset with it. But it, six months afterwards, I was uh, thinking about something else. And I said, I, I never tried to reach that guy again. Let mm. me try. And I do it. And in five minutes, I have an answer. And I said, come on. 
It's really yeah. all about timing. The guy was happy when he received the message, so he decided to answer back. And I, yeah. I met people that I really needed to meet because of this. So in a, educate in a, in a polite way, but be persistent, but be professional and try to, to do it, try to accomplish it. And trust your gut, believe in yourself, never give up. Perseverance is key, man. Absolutely. Listen, Dago, that was a pleasure to talk with you, my friend. We're going to have to leave it there. Send me the links that you want below the video. And if you want to plug anything right now, now's your opportunity. I will, I will send you the, the links for the, um, for the museum, for the red marker, for anyone. in my LinkedIn, if anyone wants to, to reach me or ask for more information. Lovely stuff. So everyone else, obviously, check out the description. You're going to find more links for Diego and all the things that you spoke about there, from the museum to the healthcare startup that's now not, not a startup at all with half a million people that has helped. <laughs> and all the other bits and bobs that Diego's talked about there, you'll find on his LinkedIn profile. So check out the links below. I'll leave my stuff down there as well so you can check me out. Wicked, thank you for your time and we'll see you soon. Okay.